Up to the 1970s, the Turkish government was trying to forge a closer relationship with Western European and North American governments. From this decade on, though, the Middle East would start to play an even larger role in Turkish government affairs. From 1961 to 1970, there was a war in Iraq between the government and Kurdish militia. The Kurds were trying to gain autonomy, and their guerrilla tactics forced the Iraqi government to the negotiation table. The Ba'athist dictatorship gave in completely, and granted the Kurds major concessions. In northern Iraq, there would now be an autonomous Kurdish zone. Among other things, the Kurdish language was made the second official language in the country. Kurdish culture was to be taught in the zone's education system. Kurds were to be given more power in the national government, and Kurdish was recognised as an official nationality under the Iraqi constitution. This was a terrifying prospect to the Kemalist Turkish government. If the Kurdish were given legitimacy in Iraq, then that set a precedent and could lead to Kurds in Turkey also launching a rebellion against the government. Since the end of the First World War, when the Ottoman Empire was dissolved, the Turkish government had focused more on the West and less on the Middle East. But this development in Iraq had serious implications for Turkey. In the rest of the decade, from the nationalist perspective of Turkish politicians, things would only get worse, and not just regarding Kurdistan. In 1973, many Arab governments launched a surprise attack on the Israeli military. As part of the Arab government's war effort, any nation which supported the Israeli government would not be sold oil. In Turkey, the next year, the price of oil increased five times its previous value, and the government would join many Western governments in founding the International Energy Agency to forestall any attempt by Middle Eastern governments to use oil as a weapon against them again. But after that year, 1974, the Turkish government would be more shunned by Western governments for its invasion of Cyprus. That year, the Greek neo-fascist military dictatorship organised a coup against the Cypriot government as part of a nationalist move to unite the island into the Greek nation. The new regime quickly began murdering supporters of the previous government, as well as the politically left wing. As Cyprus also had a large Turkish population due to the legacy of Ottoman colonialism, the nationalist Turkish government were determined not to allow Cyprus to be merged with Greece, and have the Turkish inhabitants made Greek subjects, citing a 1959 agreement which stated Cyprus wouldn't be united with any other country. Then the Cypriot regime began murdering the ethnic Turkish on the island, and the Turkish government invaded. A ceasefire was quickly called, but then the Greek military dictatorship collapsed and a democratic government came into power. The Turkish government demanded that the ethnic Turkish on the island be given autonomy, which is ironic considering how much the Turkish government repressed Kurds who wanted the same thing, and called for Greek Cypriots to move out of the Turkish parts of the country. The Cypriot government refused this demand, so the Turkish military launched a second invasion and occupied over one third of Cyprus, which they still do, and began ethnically cleansing the new Turkish-controlled zone. Because of this, the Turkish government was condemned by many Western governments. The US government refused to sell weapons to them, and would until 1978, and for the rest of the decade, the Turkish government would come to rely more on the Middle East for trade, especially oil. They would especially begin to cooperate closer with Iraq, as they often had shared interests, especially about the Kurds. In 1974 in Turkey, a Marxist-Leninist, though that changed later on, group called the Revolutionaries of Kurdistan was founded. Their original aim was to create an independent communist Kurdish state as part of the international communist revolution, so obviously at odds with the highly nationalistic policy of ensuring strict territorial integrity touted by the Kemalist Turkish government. Also in 1974, another war broke out in Iraq between the Kurds and the dictatorship. All the concessions given to the Kurds by the Ba'athist dictatorship was just a ruse to buy for time, and, to cut a long story very short, in 1974, the Iraqi military invaded the autonomous Kurdish zone, and the war ended the next year. While this was good news for the Turkish government, within two years the revolutionaries of Kurdistan began growing and organising. Up to now, well, except from the Kurdish rebellions in the 20s and 30s, the Turkish government's response for dealing with its Kurdish population had consisted of denying their identity and forcing Turkish culture onto them, silencing Kurdish activists, and keeping the subject out of the public arena. But, by the revolutionaries of Kurdistan becoming so vocal and organised, this was deemed a national security threat by the Kemalist government, and they were very worried 
about how revolutionaries of Kurdistan members were seemingly being sent to every major Turkish city to start meeting with other leftist groups. In 1977, one of the revolutionaries' leaders was killed by a leftist group, which was then accused of working with the Turkish government, and the next year other leaders got together and founded the Kurdistan Workers' Party, or PKK, in its place. They also essentially declared war on the Turkish government and any groups which opposed them. In 1979, Saddam Hussein murdered his rivals and made himself the new dictator in Iraq, while in 1980, in Turkey, a military coup toppled the government and General Kenan Evren took power. The military overthrew the government mainly because they became convinced that the government wasn't doing enough to stamp out Kurdish nationalism, or stop political violence, because the left-wing and right-wing in Turkey began fighting and killing each other. And they felt that they weren't doing enough to solve the huge economic troubles. The two dictatorships had a lot of shared interests, such as a dislike of the Syrian and Iranian regimes, and Kurdish independence movements, and would work well together. When the Iran-Iraq war started in 1980, the Turkish government became even more closely aligned with the Iraqi government. Both had a vested interest in seeing the Islamic revolutionary regime in Tehran removed, as they were non-religious dictatorships. Though, when the Turkish government began to build the Ataturk Dam in 1983, both the Syrian and Iraqi dictatorships would get angry, because they saw it as the Turkish government trying to stop the flow of the highly important Euphrates River into their countries. In many ways, the Turkish regime had no choice but to get closer to the Iraqi regime. The Kemalist ideology of the Turkish government stressed becoming closer to the Western world, but it wasn't really working by the 1980s. The years-long attempts to join the European economic community were going nowhere, because of human rights abuses, an anti-democratic government, and the invasion and occupation of Cyprus back in 1974. Turkish immigrant workers in Europe, who sent lots of much-needed money back to Turkey, were being given less visas in place of Eastern European workers. This added to the rising unemployment and inflation in Turkey, and was a big problem for the government. But the Iraqi regime could act as a source of money instead. During the war, the Iraqi dictatorship would sell oil to the Turkish dictatorship, and buy products back from them. So, the Iraqi regime's war got funded, and the Turkish regime got some help with its economic troubles. Sort of. Saddam even gave Evren the right to send his forces across the border during the war as part of the Turkish government's conflict with the PKK, who, in 1984, launched a guerrilla war against them. So, why were the Iraqi and Turkish regimes only sort of helping each other out? Well, Saddam's dictatorship was low on money during the war with Iran, and so had to go massively in debt to keep everything going. Saddam's regime took out loans with the Turkish government and paid for products from Turkey using credit. So, in other words, Saddam was getting more in debt. That would become an issue at the end of the war, as would the fact that the Iraqi dictatorship was now the regional military power and the Cold War was seemingly ending. The Turkish government, faced with the prospect of no longer being geostrategically important to NATO or the US government, also had to contend with an expansionist Iraqi regime with a lot of economic troubles, led by a man who liked to solve problems with violence. <laughs>